find out how Russia makes tech magic happen, all you have to do is hop on a flight from Moscow to Siberia. Yes, that's Siberia. It's not just for gulags anymore. It's hard to wrap your head around how big Siberia is, and even harder to understand how most people live here. So to get acquainted, I found Dimitri, a real natural-born Siberian man, to initiate me into the ways of the Russian wilderness. I'm sure this is a good idea, right? <laughs> Perfect idea. <laughs> a trip to the Banya is an ancient, and some would say masochistic, Russian bonding ritual that consists of three delightful steps. OK, Ashley, Inferno is uh, ready for endurance. Step one, nearly have heat stroke. Step two, shrinkage. <laughs> Step three, get whacked. What does this do? Keep silent, please. Oh. When he's not beating other men with birch branches, my new Russian friend Dmitri is a philosophy professor <laughs> here in Akadem Gorodok. That's my destination, a small town hours by plane from Moscow and about 30 minutes outside Russia's third largest city, Novosibirsk. Nikita Khrushchev's government declared 60 years ago that this would be the Siberian home of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Built from nothing in the middle of a remote taiga forest that stretches halfway around the planet. The Akadem Gorodok, it was the first Soviet technopolis and it was a good opportunity for many young scientists. How has it changed over the last 40 years? In comparison to Soviet time, uh, we have not so much opportunities, uh, but uh, we love our place because <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, 40 institutes, a real scientific community. Do you want a toast? Mm -hmm. What will we toast here? No piety to the enemies of Science. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Soaked, swatted, steaming, and having proven my loyalty to science, I was ready to explore Akadem Gorodok. Here, the Soviets hid temples to science in the trees with shrines to match, like this one to all the mice they sacrificed on the altar of genetic research. Inside the Nuclear Physics Institute, it feels like I walked onto the set of Dr. Strangelove. These analog dials, laser contraptions, and miles of metal pipes were all built to push nuclear science to its summit, replicating the sun's power by smashing atoms together. People have been chasing fusion for decades. What's still encouraging and exciting about this field? The, the scientific problem is like a huge mountain. And uh, for 60 years, people are trying to get to the top. Everything uh, around the base of the mountain is like a trash dump <laughs> with, with, with old bodies and stuff. But uh, you can imagine the results you can achieve when you get to the top. Professor Alexei Beklumishev researches something called open trap mechanisms to encourage fusion. In theory, it's a shortcut to the top of the mountain with a smaller load. This is also useful in order to make uh, plasma thrusters for space ships. So you could <laughs> use this to power a spaceship going to Mars? Uh, yeah. Uh, at the moment, it is just an idea. It, it needs a lot of refinement. So this is more of like a 2080 sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Soviet government attracted brilliant minds like Alexei's to Siberia with spacious apartments and the kind of prestige they could only get 
in a town founded as a utopian nerdocracy. But when the Soviet Union fell, so did the walls keeping scientists here. And many of them bolted to work at IBM or MIT or Boeing. For those who stayed, the utopia has lost its luster. Over time, uh, the difference in pay between scientists and, say, bus drivers went in favor of bus drivers. Okay. <laughs> if you are overworked and without pay, you, you want to go elsewhere. Ten years ago, the Russian government decided it needed to hit refresh on the entire town to pull Siberian science out of its post-Soviet slump. They're turning to a new generation of engineers, plucked from the taiga to lead the way. And one of the most successful so far is Dmitry Trubitsyn. Today, uh, Akademik Gradok is uh, changing. Now there are not only scientists, but there are also um, a lot of companies. More like startups. Yeah, yeah more like startups. Dmitry's company, Tion, started off making king-size air filters for hospitals and other businesses. As far as starting a company here, you didn't think, now that I have this idea, I'm going to run off to Silicon Valley. You decided this was the spot where you would give it a go. Well, it's a very comfortable place, and there are a lot of uh, good, smart uh, people here. Also, we have very fresh air here, and it's very it's useful. Your company. Yeah, <laughs> it's very useful for our company because we can we can compare the air we produce with the cleanest air in the world. Today, Dmitry is the poster boy for a Siberian startup success story. And he feels like he's close to the finish line on phase one of his vision. Phase two takes him to China, where his company is rapidly expanding. There he hopes to get his devices out of hospitals and into homes with this little guy that detects pollutants in the air. You just blow over the top? Or it, doesn't it doesn't matter. Like CO2. It will feel it. That's enough. Look, it goes down. So the lights are going down. Yeah. It means that air quality is not very good. Now it tried to increase the speed of a fan in breezer in this room to lower the concentration of carbon dioxide. Cool. That seems to work. <laughs> <laughs> Dimitri is not a wholly self-made man. Tion's success belongs to him, but it's built on a blueprint drawn up by the Russian government. His headquarters is on a sprawling government-funded campus called Akadem Park, with this crazy tower in the middle of it. Not recommended if you have a fear of heights. This place is a prime example of one of the big ideas in Russian tech, a cradle-to-grave genius factory. Across the country, they start them young with a strictly uniform education, heavy on math and science. They pull the best out of Siberia and send them down the street to Novosibirsk State University. From there, they used to funnel their brains to places like the Nuclear Institute. But now that that's a bit retro, many of them end up here, in the Tech Tower. Here it's like someone visited a few Silicon Valley startups, punched the copy button, ran it through Google Translate, and then hit paste in the middle of Siberia. Here's the living wall, only here it's dead. Here's the makerspace and the 3D printed Putin. Here's the gym, only it's Siberia, so it comes with bear. Hello, innovation. Case in point, my new friend, Kirill. Where are you from originally? Uh, I was born here in Akadem Gradok. Was your father and mother engineers as well? Yeah, yeah. They graduated from Novosibir State University, and they was a computer engineer, Soviet computer engineer with big uh, computers. OK. <laughs> you can tell by the Terminator-looking device on the table that Kirill makes drones. He says his drone is special because it can take off vertically and then fly very, very far, very, very fast. Kirill sees an Optiplane drone flying miles along high-tension power lines. 
checking for breaks. We're zooming to the site of forest fires and floods across Siberia. A team of engineers barely out of high school and most definitely still in college, built this carbon fiber prototype by hand in four months. It's quite a challenge to start a drone startup in Russia because of low constraints, because of investment climate. Traditions of, of, of mind of our clients is not so easy to, to break. This is seen as sort of radical. Yeah, it's kind of radical uh, technology. So this drone company started in a Russian government-funded incubator is too radical for its clients, who maybe you guessed it, are part of the Russian government. Optiplane's first contract came from the Russian version of FEMA, and it built this first prototype with money from a government-backed venture capital firm. They wouldn't exist without the government, and they barely exist because of it. Russia is a very centralized country. So the United States, for example, with state laws, is faster than in Russia. You have to get exceptions to test your drones and, and fly them yeah. around here, and that's difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. So are there many drone companies in Russia? Not so many as in, in <laughs> America. <laughs> it looks really cool. It looks yeah. good, yeah. Like uh, uh, Skynet <laughs> or, or something like that. Yeah. It's through the sheer force of their engineering smarts and passion that Optiplane has gotten off the ground. Out here in Siberia, they're part of one grand experiment in state-supported innovation. We'll have to see what the next 60 years bring to this silicon forest. <laughs>